Well, this evening, as I've already mentioned, we are looking at uh, uh, the fifth commandment. And why don't we go ahead and begin by reading um, not just the commandment we're going to be looking at, but um, beginning in verse 1, reading through to where we are in the Ten Commandments. So that would be verses 1 through 12. This is what we read. Then God spoke all these words, saying, I am the Lord your God who brought you out of the land of Egypt, out of the house of slavery. You shall have no other gods before me. You shall not make for yourself an idol or any likeness of what is in heaven above or on the earth beneath or in the water under the earth. You shall not worship them or serve them, for I, the Lord your God, am a jealous God, visiting the iniquity of the fathers on the children, on the third and the fourth generations of those who hate me, but showing loving kindness to thousands to those who love me and keep my commandments. You shall not take the name of the Lord your God in vain, for the Lord will not leave him unpunished who takes his name in vain. Remember the Sabbath day to keep it holy. Six days you shall labor and do all your work, but the seventh day is a Sabbath of the Lord your God. In it you shall not do any work, you or your son or your daughter, your male or your female servant or your cattle or your sojourner who stays with you. For in six days the Lord made the heavens and the earth, the sea and all that is in them and rested on the seventh day. Therefore the Lord blessed the Sabbath day and made it holy. Honor your father and your mother that your days may be prolonged in the land which the Lord your God gives you. May the Lord bless His Word to our hearing again this evening. Now, as you've already heard, um, before we started our mini-Reformation series on Luther and the reasons why he was compelled to uh, speak out against the church's teaching of his day, we were looking at why we believe in the continuance of the Ten Commandments. And I, I... I know that I, I stress this a lot, or at least I have in the past, and the reason I do is because there are so many churches today that don't believe this. And again, it's, it's quite, quite amazing to me, and I hope we're going to see some reasons this evening why uh, obedience is not optional for the believer. But there are churches that actually believe that obedience is optional, that if you trust in Jesus Christ, if you pray the sinner's prayer, at least in their view, you're saved. And you can go on your merry way and not do anything that the Lord calls you to do. And there are still also other churches that believe that um, uh, there, perhaps there is obedience, but that obedience does not have to be to these commandments. Uh, they believe that these commandments, at least many within the evangelical church, really had to do only with Israel and that only Israel had to obey them, and even today Israel has to obey them because, again, this is part of a covenant God made with them. I'm talking about dispensationalism. Not all dispensationalists necessarily believe this, but certainly a majority of them do. Some of them go as far as to say not only uh, do we not have to observe the Old Testament scriptures, but we don't even have to observe most of the New Testament either, just the letters that were written specifically to Gentiles. Again, because we're not Jewish and because we're not in the Jewish covenant, we only have to pay attention to those things specifically addressed uh, to the Gentiles. And, of course, that tremendously limits what it is we have to observe, which means we don't have to read very much and we don't have to do very much, although I suspect we still find quite a bit there. But what I want us to see is that the Scriptures as a whole are for God's people for all ages, for His church uh, from the time it began, really, with Adam and Eve, uh, through to the present day, which means that everything that God says in His Word is basically for us. It's still valid for today, except for those parts which He has clearly done away with. You know, the ceremonial law, for instance, was pointing to the Lord Jesus Christ, types and shadows and so forth. And when Jesus Christ came and fulfilled those things and God tore the, the veil of the temple, the ceremonial system was done away with. We don't have to bring animal sacrifices to the Lord. The sacrifice we come to God through is the sacrifice of Christ, which, as we know, the Lord's table reminds us. We also don't have to keep the civil law, 
because it was really addressed to Israel in a specific uh, time and place. There were certain things they had to do that we don't necessarily have to do when Israel as a nation as it, you know, passed away. So did these commandments except for the principles of righteousness and justice that are contained in them. Because remember, those laws were just simply the moral law applied to civil life. So there are principles that certainly continue. Now, since that is the case, since the Scripture is for the church for all time, we shouldn't be surprised when we find such things in the New Testament as 2 Timothy 3, 16 and 17, that says, all Scripture is inspired by God and profitable for teaching, for reproof, for correction, for training in righteousness, so that the man of God may be adequate, equipped for every good work. Now, what, do, uh, what does dispensationalism do with this? Well, they would say, okay, yeah, the Old Testament has some value. It uh, gives us some examples of some principles that still continue, and so uh, we can use that. It gives to us also the working out of God's plan of redemption. That's certainly uh, valuable. But one thing I want us to see here is that when Paul here was referring to the Scriptures, he was referring primarily to the Old Testament Scriptures. For one thing, not all the New Testament was written by this time. Also, he was speaking specifically to Timothy, who had been raised by a Jewish grandmother and a Jewish mother. Paul says that from, from infancy, he had known the Holy Scriptures that are able to make him wise unto salvation. He was referring primarily to the Old Testament Scriptures. Paul here is saying the Old Testament is inspired, it is profitable, it is useful, so that we as New Testament believers may be trained in righteousness and equipped for every good work. The Old Testament Scriptures, there's still a tremendous amount in there that we need. And we shouldn't be surprised, too, if this is the case, that we find Paul, as we saw this morning, telling us that uh, we need to keep the commandments. As a matter of fact, even telling us that um, they actually tell us how to love. Again, we read in Romans 13, verses 8 through 10, Paul says, "'Owe nothing to anyone except to love one another, for he who loves his neighbor has fulfilled the law.'" What law was he referring to? The Ten Commandments. He says, "'For this you shall not commit adultery, you shall not murder, you shall not steal, you shall not covet,' which are all quoting the Ten Commandments. And if there is any other commandment, it is summed up in the saying, "'You shall love your neighbor as yourself.'" Love does no wrong to a neighbor. Therefore, love is the fulfillment of the law. Basically, we believe the Ten Commandments are the expression of God's holy nature. It is what He wants us to do as human beings. And as long as we are human beings under the authority of God, living in this world, this is the way He wants us to live from the very beginning to the very end. This has always been His standard. Again, remembering that God didn't give us the law in order to save us, but having trusted in the Lord Jesus Christ, having been saved by His grace, He gives us the law to teach us how to love, how to love God and how to love our neighbor as we should. Now, with that in mind, let's continue then to look at how it is the Lord tells us to do this. Now, we've already, you know, completed the first to the fourth commandments regarding how we are to love God, and uh, maybe you heard make mention of this in, in the opening prayer. Uh, we are to love God and have Him solely as our God. We are to love Him most of all. You shall have no other gods before me. You shall not make for yourself any likeness of heaven above, earth beneath. You shall not worship them or serve them, which tells us that God wants to be worshipped in a certain way. We saw how that is according to the commandments that we are to not, use, not to use His name in vain, which, which doesn't mean just not to use it as a swear word, but to make sure that when we make a promise or make a vow or take an oath, that we are speaking the truth and that we keep our promises and our vows. And of course, keeping the Lord's day holy means that today we are to keep ourselves, separate ourselves from the world in order to worship the Lord, separate ourselves from our work and our recreations and our thoughts regarding those things and focus on the Lord that we might grow into His likeness, that we might love Him more, cultivate that relationship. We need time to do that. And the Lord actually gives us an entire day uh, 
in which we can do that. I would refer you to the uh, website for those uh, particular sermons if you'd like to review those. Now, the Ten Commandments are really a summary of everything that the Lord would call us to do. Uh, the only thing that we might say is not, it, well, it is covered, but not specifically in the commandments is the command to evangelize. And yet it's implied by the fact that we are to love our neighbor as ourselves because where does one find the power uh, to do what the Lord calls us to do in these commandments except through the grace of God? The Bible says the best we can do is just give outward obedience. We can go through the motions. We can have the form of what God requires and still not have the substance of it, which is to do these things because we love Him and to do these things because we want to honor Him. Only the gospel can give us the power to do that. And so it's implied that uh, we, we need to trust in Jesus Christ before we can do these things. So again, this is not a covenant of works that God is giving to us. It's not a path of salvation, but it's rather the way by which we might honor and serve the Lord, having trusted in the Lord Jesus Christ, that we might love Him and love our neighbor. Well, this evening we're going to consider the fifth commandment, the first that has to do with how we are to love our neighbor. And uh, I want us to look at four things. I want us to look at what this commandment is actually calling us to do. We're going to see that it's broader than just honoring our parents. How we are to exercise authority if the Lord has entrusted us with authority according to this command. Uh, how we are to submit to authority when we are under authority, and really all of us are, there is nobody who isn't, and then what the Lord promises that He will do for us if we will uh, keep this command. So first of all, what does the Lord actually call us to do in this commandment? More broadly speaking, He really calls us here to submit to every authority that He has ordained. Now, we need to see that the commandment is broader than it appears on the surface because on the surface, it commands us or He commands us to honor our father and our mother, which means, of course, primarily our natural parents, that we are to treat them in a particular way, respectfully. We are to um, speak to them and speak about them respectfully. We are to submit to their authority over us as long, of course, as what they call us to do doesn't contradict what God says. There is a hierarchy of, of submission. We have to obey God rather than men. Now, that much is clear. I think that I think we can all see that on the surface. It's, it's clear to see what it calls us to do, although it's not necessarily always easy to do it because we do naturally not like, or we resent authority. But I do want us to see under this point that the commandment is actually much broader than just our parents. It applies to how early we are to honor every authority that the Lord has placed over us. In the Bible, the word father in particular is applied to just about anyone who has authority. So when the Lord says honor father and mother, He does have in view their authority in general, not just father and mother in particular. For instance, the word father can apply to governmental authority. One example of that is where David, you know, we know his father was Jesse. And yet there is an instance where he calls Saul, who was the king at that time, his father. It was on that occasion where David was, and his men were hiding in the cave and Saul went in there. David had the opportunity to kill him, but he didn't. And after Saul emerges from the cave, David wants to show him that he's still respecting his authority. He says this in 1 Samuel 24, 11. Now, my father, see, indeed, see the edge of your robe in my hand. For in that I cut off the edge of your robe and did not kill you, know and perceive that there is no evil or rebellion in my hands, and I have not sinned against you, though you are lying in wait for my life to take it. Notice David called Saul my father. It's applied in another instance either to uh, military authority or domestic authority. I'm not sure which is in mind here, depending upon whether Naaman's servants were actually household servants or whether they were his soldiers. But when Naaman's soldiers or servants actually came to encourage him to do what Elisha the prophet told him he needed to do, 
in order to be healed of his leprosy, which was to dip in the Jordan River seven times, they called him Father, 2 Kings 5.13. Then his servants came near and spoke to him and said, My father, had the prophet told you to do some great thing, would you not have done it? How much more then when he says to you, wash and be clean? The word father also applies to ecclesiastical authority. Uh, there's the instance in Scripture where Elisha went out with Elijah when he was to be taken up into heaven in the fiery chariot. And when that happened, Elisha saw it and cried out, My father, my father, the chariots of Israel and its horsemen. And he saw Elijah no more. Then he took hold of his own clothes and tore them in two pieces. Now, the point of this is that this commandment really requires us to respect and honor all authority in whatever sphere the Lord has ordained it, as long as that authority does not require us to sin against God. Now, we see in the New Testament exactly what we'd expect to see with regard to what, you know, what we're called upon to submit to. We are called upon to submit to those who are in authority over us in government. As we saw in our meditation, every person is to be in subjection to the governing authorities. For there is no authority except from God. And those which exist are established by God. And by the way, that's a, uh, there, there's, uh, this expands beyond uh, government here, as you can see. There's no authority that exists in the world except from God. Those which exist are established by Him, not just government, but every authority. And there are several spheres of authority. There's government, there's family, and there are ch there's church. Uh, we are to submit to those who are over us in the sphere of the family. There is authority as well. Paul writes in Ephesians 5, 22 through 23, Wives, be subject to your own husbands as to the Lord. For the husband is the head of the wife, as Christ also is the head of the church, he himself being the Savior of the body. There is authority of parents over children. Paul writes in uh, Ephesians 6, verses 1 through 3, Children, obey your parents in the Lord, for this is right. Honor your father and your mother, which is the first commandment with a promise, so that it may be well with you and that you may live long on the earth. And there is authority in the sphere of the church. Uh, the author to the Hebrews writes in Hebrews 13, 17, Obey your leaders and submit to them, for they keep watch over your souls as those who will give an account. Let them do this with joy and not with grief, for this would be unprofitable for you. Basically, the Lord is telling us in the fifth commandment that you are to honor and submit to all the authority that God has ordained whether that authority is in government, in the family, or in the church, that you are to treat them respectfully, that you are to speak of them and to them respectfully, and you are to submit to them as long as they're exercising that authority within the bounds of what God has ordained, as long as they are not telling you to sin. Now, again, before we all panic, Let's not forget that the authority that God has put in place, the authority that He has ordained, was given for a specific purpose, and it is to be exercised in a particular way, and that way is always good. It's always good for us, and that should make it easier to submit to. But before we get to how we should submit to authority, let's look at how it is to be exercised. That's our second point how we are to exercise this authority if we should have one of these particular offices of governor, husband, parent, or elder. Now, I do think it's clear in Scripture that the Lord gives this authority to those who have it for the good of those who are under your care, that you may protect them, that you may care for them, that you may nurture them. And I think that's quite clear in, in each of these contexts. I mean, why does God give government the power of the sword and this authority that we are to submit to? Paul writes in Romans 13, verses 3 through 4, rulers are not, a, well, we should submit to it because rulers are not a cause of fear for good behavior, but for evil. Do you want to have no fear of authority? Do what is good, 
and you will have praise from the same, for it is a minister of God to you for your good. Now, I realize we look at the government uh, that we have today and we wonder whether they're actually doing what they're supposed to be doing. In some cases, they're not. We don't have to submit, as we've seen, to everything, only those things which are not sinful. But overall, authority, the authority that God has, has ordained is always for our good. If we didn't even have the authority that we had, if we had anarchy instead, uh, there would be, uh, well... It would be a very dangerous situation in which to live. Authority is absolutely essential. With regard to husbands, uh, why does the Lord give authority to husbands? What is He supposed to do with it? Ephesians 5, verses 25 through 30. Husbands, love your wives just as Christ also loved the church and gave Himself up for her so that He might sanctify her having cleansed her by the washing of water with the word, that he might present to himself the church in all her glory, having no spot or wrinkle or any such thing, but that she would be holy and blameless. So husbands ought also to love their own wives as their own bodies. He who loves his own wife loves himself, for no one ever hated his own flesh, but nourishes and cherishes it just as Christ also does the church, because we are members of His body. That doesn't sound too threatening to me. Does that sound threatening to you? And with regard to parents, why does the Lord give uh, parents authority over children? Well, it's for a specific purpose. Fathers, do not provoke your children to anger, but bring them up in the discipline and instruction of the Lord. It is to rear them to discipline them, to instruct them, to go the right way for their good. And that's the only reason. And then the Lord says to the elders through the Apostle Paul in Acts 20, verse 28, Be on guard for yourselves and for all the flock, among which the Holy Spirit has made you overseers to shepherd the church of God, which He purchased with His own blood. He goes on to say that after my departure, savage wolves will will seek to steal part of the flock, but you need to watch out for them. You need to guard them. He says, or the author to the Hebrews says this, Obey your leaders and submit to them, for they keep watch over your souls. As those who will give an account, let them do this with joy and not with grief, for this would be unprofitable for you. So in the case of government, it is a minister to you for your good. In the case of husbands, they are to love and cherish and nurture their wives as their own body, as Christ would His own church. Parents, they are to raise their children in the discipline and instruction of the Lord. And the elders of the church are to shepherd the flock of God and keep watch over your souls so that you don't go astray and end up destroying yourself. In other words, the Lord has ordained all the authority that He has for your good, for your benefit as a minister to you on his behalf. What does this say about tyranny? Tyranny is always condemned in Scripture. The Lord never gives authority to, to you to force those who are under your authority to do your will. That's not what this authority is for. And if that's what you're using that authority for, you need to repent of that. He gave it to you so that you would have what you needed to care for, to love, to protect and nurture those who are under your charge and to lead them in the ways of the Lord for their well-being. That is how authority is to be used. Now, understanding that, then when we get to the next point, how are those under authority to respond to it? Makes it a little bit easier, I hope, to submit to. We do need to remember, first of all, that every single one of us here are under some authority of one kind or another, maybe of all, I suppose, in a certain sense. We're all under the authority of the state. They do have certain authority. They bear the sword. They are a minister to God for our good. There is a government. We are under them, so we are under that authority. Uh, Certainly, there's a sense in which we are all under family authority. That's true of wives to their husbands children to their parents, and what about 
you know, all of us here are children, no matter how old we are. And even if our parents have died, uh, Scripture bears out there's still a sense in which we are to honor them and the things that they have taught us as they have brought to us the things that we needed for our good. We still need to listen to them. We still need to remember what they taught us, and we still need to do it. We're, of course, all under ecclesiastical authority. Even the elders are under the authority of other elders because we need that accountability. We need that shepherding of our souls. All of us are under authority. So how are we to respond to this authority? Well, the Lord tells us that we are to honor those who are in authority over us. We are to submit to those who are in authority over us, that we need to submit to them respectfully, willingly, even cheerfully, without fighting and without delay. In other words, we are to submit to them as we would submit to the Lord. Now, why should we do that? Well, it's because God is the one who ordained it. All authority has been ordained by God. It's a minister to us, again, for good, but it comes from His hand. That's why Paul writes in Ephesians 5, 22 and 23, just one example of how wives are to submit to their husbands. Wives, be subject to your own husbands as to the Lord. For the husband is the head of the wife, as Christ also is the head of the church. He himself being the Savior of the body. And again, Paul's reminding us in Romans 13 in the opening verses that all authority has been ordained by God and put in place for our good. If God is the one who ordained it, and He ordained it for our good, then we should subject ourselves to it as to the Lord because this is the way that God is caring for us in each of these different spheres. It is a, even government is called a minister of God for our good. Now, like I said, we may not like everything about the government that we happen to be under, but it's, God still intends it to be a minister for our good. There are still many good things that we get from even the government that, that we have, even though they've fallen in many ways from what it is that God would have them uh, to do. So when we submit to these authorities, we are submitting to the Lord, which is why, again, Paul says to wives, wives, subject yourselves to your husbands as to the Lord, because this is His authority. Subject yourself to the government as to the Lord. Subject yourself to the elders as to the Lord, because this is how the Lord mediates His gracious and benevolent rule over each one of us. All of these are His servants, and remember, they are servants for our good. We, we need them, and they are to be doing good for us. Now, again, let's remind ourselves that if any of these authorities contradict the Lord, if they tell you to do something sinful, if they tell you to do something, you know, that, that's not good, if they tell you, let, let's say, to do something that God tells you not to do or not to do something He tells you to do, well, you have to obey God rather than men. Remember what Peter said to the leaders of Israel when they commanded him and John not to speak or teach at all in the name of Jesus anymore. This is what they said in return. And again, that was a lawful authority, which under other circumstances they would submit to, even as Paul did when he reviled the high priest, didn't realize it was the high priest. Somebody told him who you know, it was, and then he said, oh, well, I... I sin by doing that because you're not to speak evil of the leaders of your people. Well, how do you respond when your leaders tell you to do something you shouldn't do? This is what they said. Whether it is right in the sight of God to give heed to you rather than to God, you be the judge, for we cannot stop speaking about what we have seen and heard. On another occasion... Peter and the apostles said to these same leaders, we must obey God rather than men. And so if the authorities are not using their authority the way that the Lord calls them to do by commanding us to do things contrary to His will, we don't submit to that. We have to obey God rather than men. We do, that, that applies to every sphere of authority. So there are limits to this authority. Now, what should you do if your authority comes to you with a tyrannical or a harsh spirit? Well, if what they're telling you to do is still the right thing to do, then you still need to submit to it as long as it doesn't contradict His Word. 
Think about what Peter says in 1 Peter 2, verses 18 and 19 with regard to servants and masters, because here's another sphere of authority. We are servants under all the masters. That's another way of just simply saying authority and those under authority. Servants, be submissive to your masters with all respect. Well, that's what we should expect according to the fifth commandment. Not only to those who are good and gentle, but also to those who are unreasonable. For this finds favor. If for the sake of conscience toward God, a person bears up under sorrows when suffering unjustly. So if they don't come to us in the right spirit, but yet they are telling us to do things that we ought to be doing, we still need to submit to it. However, we also recognize that if they continue to behave this way, and and this is a particular situation where servants don't have any way to redress this, but in the case of government and family and in uh, church, there are means to redress it. And if they are sinning by so doing, by continuing this, then it needs to be redressed in in the proper way. But still, if what they're telling us to do is the right thing to do, we still need to do it. And by the way, I should mention this. If you happen to have authority and you come to those who are under your authority and they don't do what they should be doing, they don't respond exactly as they should, you don't always have to Uh, respond in a way, of course, never respond in a way that's sinful. But basically, take the role of a servant and do what you can to try to encourage them, uh, to love them, to help them do what it is they really need to be doing. You know, as far as leadership goes, Jesus is our perfect example, as He is in virtually every area. Now, Jesus had authority, and He exercised that authority in His ministry But He did it in such a perfect way, in such a gracious and loving way, that it really wasn't hard at all for His disciples to submit to it. That is the example that we are to emulate in in our authority or using our authority is to use it the way that, that Jesus used it. I mean, He points husbands in particular to love their wives as Christ loved the church, and I think every sphere of authority would do well to do exactly the same thing because that's what the Lord wants us to do. We are to use, again, that authority for the good of those under our authority, and that's exactly what Jesus Christ did. And if we aren't using it that way, then we're sinning. The Lord does not intend this to be tyranny, the tyranny of, of, of those under your authority, but rather you are to use that authority to build them up, to minister to them, to nurture them. You are to use it for their good. See, again, authority doesn't seem quite so daunting if we see that that is the purpose behind it. Now, finally, what does the Lord promise to us if we will submit to His authority, uh, to these ministers that He has ordained in the state, in the home, and in the church? Well, if the command to honor father and mother uh, applies to all these authorities, which I believe it does, I do believe the blessing does as well. Exodus 20, verse 12 Honor your father and your mother, that your days may be prolonged in the land which the Lord your God gives you. Again, how do we know that applies to today? Well, Paul actually quotes the fifth commandment when he's writing to, I believe it was the church at Ephesus, and tells them that children ought to obey their parents, and if they do, this, this is the blessing they can expect to receive. Again, I think I quoted this once before, but Ephesians 6, verses 1 through 3. Children, obey your parents in the Lord, for this is right. Honor your father and mother, which is the first commandment with a promise, so that it may be well with you and that you may live long on the earth. I do think that um, the, the commandment is just slightly changed here before it had reference to the promised land. Uh, to to Israel, that you may live long in the land. But now Paul takes it and applies it, it it appears, to to the earth or to the world because in the New Covenant, you know, the the whole field, as it were, that the Lord would have us to labor in has expanded uh, to the world. But notice that it's not something that's passed away. It's not something that's now archaic and irrelevant, was only for Israel But he takes the same commandment and the same promise and he makes application here. And if you will submit to this, if you will honor this authority, this is the promise that it may be well with you 
I think that's what we all desire, isn't it? That things be well with us. That's sort of a generic term that refers to every area of life. And that you may live long on the earth. I think a long life we recognize as a blessing. Well, if, if that's what you want, if you want to live a long time and, and not to live in misery for a long time, because that's not a blessing, but to live a long time and that things would go well with you, well, this is how you achieve it. Doing what the Lord calls you to do in honoring authority. Because if you will honor the Lord by honoring the authority that He has put over you, He will honor you in this way by giving you a long and fulfilled life. So basically, here is, here's the road to happiness. You know, If you want to be happy, if you want things to be well, if you want to live a long time, this is the way that you can achieve it. Not by seeking for these things, as it were, for yourself and, and you know, uh, disobeying authority and casting it off, doing it my way, it's got to be my way, but rather submitting. It's not by trumping, it's not by tyrannizing, it's not by rebelling, it's by submitting to the Lord in the authority that He has ordained in this world, submitting to Him as He ministers His will through His ministers. So if you want to find happiness, it, it can only be by submission to God's will. That's the only way. Uh, some people, of course, the people of the world who hate the laws we saw earlier this evening or as we heard earlier this evening, they, they hate the law. They think that by, by rejecting this authority of God and, and seeking their own things that they're going to find happiness. But we know that the end of that path is not happiness but absolute misery, misery in this world. Those that indulge in the things of the world mostly are the ones who are most miserable, the ones who destroy their lives. And at the end of the road, what is there? Hell for those who reject God's law, who reject His authority and who will not submit to Him. But to those who will submit to Him, there is this blessing. There is happiness. There is a long life. It will go well with you. If you want this blessing, it doesn't come by seeking your own things. It comes by submitting to the Lord. And so may the Lord give us all the grace that we need to be able to submit to the authorities that He has put in this world as ministers for our good, that we might actually gain that blessing. This is the path. May He give us the grace to walk in it. Well, let's bow for a moment of prayer and let's ask that the Lord would help us to do that.